Welcome to Nerds at Church, a queer feminist podcast diving deep into faith, nerdery, and the Bible. I'm Pastor Emily, and I use pronouns like they, them, theirs. And I'm Pastor Kay, and my pronouns are she, her. And I'm Pastor Kristen Rice, and my pronouns are she, they. In this episode, we're discussing space programs. Woohoo! Three, two, one, blast off! We do have one content notification for you for this episode. We have a brief conversation about space program related deaths. Check out the episode description for links to any references we make in this episode. So, for our deep dive into space programs, we are excited to have our special guest, Reverend Kristen Rice, who serves as the ELCA campus pastor for Purdue Lutheran Ministry, along with her dog, Blessing. Along with space nerding, Kristen is also a coffee connoisseur and uses coffee as her love language. Woohoo! They are also the person I know, as mentioned in our intro episode, who loves NASA and space programs more than anybody else I know. Which is yeah. saying a lot. So, like Emily knows so many space people. I know. Right. <laughs> space nerdery comes with it. And Baltimore apparently comes with it. Because, like, Goddard is oh, sure. here. Yeah. Anyway... Kristen, I'm so excited for you to be on this podcast. I'm pretty excited too, because this is kind of my personality and uh, (laughs) it's fun to share. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I love it. I love it. And this is one of our later in the season episodes, but one of our earlier in the season recordings for the episode. So if we're missing any big space events that happen, that's why. Yeah. How did you get so interested in space programs? Like, what's your favorite space flight? All the things. Yes. Yeah. How, how did this become my personality? So, <laughs> well, and I say that because I am absolutely wearing my Saturn V socks. <laughs> yes. Five years ago, I visited Kennedy Space Center on a whim and they have holes in them. I need a new pair. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I like that you visited Kennedy Space Center just on a whim, not on purpose. Well, you just like happened by. Presumably to get socks. I'm assuming. Socks. And I had a pair of pants that had NASA on the side, but they wore out. So I had to throw them oh. away, which was a huge bummer. Can I just say That's that you are sad. exactly the kind of guest that we've always wanted to have on this program? <laughs> oh my gosh. I'm so honored. <laughs> I should also note I'm wearing an astronaut band aid. Oh, oh my gosh. Goodness, that's adorable. Not just for funsies, like I actually cut myself. I don't know how oh, no. this morning, but I'm like perfect excuse for the astronaut band-aid. Yeah, and it's just like perfectly positioned. None of our listeners can see this, obviously, but it's perfectly positioned to just hold out your hand and show yes. us. And I love it. You could just have your own little puppet show with your astronaut band-aid. Yeah, yeah. kind of, kind of. Anyway, so... <laughs> What year did Apollo 13, the movie, come out? Like, 95? Anyway, whenever that movie came out, I was in middle school, and I remember watching it at home, and my dad kind of sharing, like, what he remembered of Apollo 13 happening. And in my brain, that was, like, the first I connected, oh, this is, like, a real-life movie, and people had real-life experiences. I want to know more. And so that summer, we also went out to Washington, D.C. for like family vacation. And we stopped at the Air and Space Museum, which is one of my favorite places Mm -hmm. on Earth now. And I remember kind of walking through some of the displays and just being like, whoa, this is wild because they've got some of the old crafts and things. And at least at the time, there was a room that had all of the astronauts, like all the early astronauts and their information. And so I got my first book. From the gift shop there, which is Lost Moon, The Voyage of Apollo 13, written by Jim Lovell. That movie also got me to read that book. Absolutely. Although, (laughs) instead of getting it from a store, I kind of stole my mom's copy. Oh, even better. (laughs) Even better. That does seem like the quality. This is, I think, the third copy of the book that I owned because I have loved it a lot. But then the other book I got is called Moonshot, and it's by Alan Shepard and Deke Slayton. Oh, sure. They are two of the original Mercury 7 astronauts. And so those two books are really kind of what launched it for me. (laughs) And it just became my earliest hyperfixation, and I could not get enough about wanting to learn about, especially my niche is like the 60s, is Mercury, Gemini, Apollo. That's the whole thing. And this was before the internet, because I'm that old. And so yeah, I don't sure. even know how I got connected to all of the things that I did. But So I'm going to blame Apollo 13, and I'm going to blame Jim Lovell, because he's the <laughs> grandfather I wish I'd had in my life. So. Oh, yeah. That's fantastic. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. I also watched Apollo 13, but was, I think I'm a little bit younger than both of you. And so I was like 
too young to go buy the book. Sure. We had it on VHS. I think I might have it in a box somewhere on VHS. Nice. And Kay and I are going to do a movie commentary on it for our Patreon subscribers. Yay. Actually, it'll come out around the time of this episode. <gasps> yeah, probably. Oh, that's so exciting. <laughs> Yay. So, uh, Kristen, you already said that your time of fascination is in the 1960s with this. Speaking of which, the initial space race started between Russia and America. Can you tell us some of the history behind how all that went down? I know a lot of it was connected to the arms race. And so sure. mm-hmm. as they were creating, you know, rockets for blasting and hurting humans, which is not great. Somewhere along the lines, they decided let's not just put rockets horizontally but how far they can go vertically. And so in part, like the top one I can think of is Werner von Braun, was a German scientist that America brought over. Well, <sighs> kind of moved past the Nazi connections that a lot of those yeah. early guys had. I was wondering, I feel like we did that a lot. <laughs> yeah. Which might explain some things today. But yeah, yeah, big time. So I think in the effort after World War II and as the Cold War kind of started, it was more of a who can do the biggest and best first between the U.S. and Russia as the yeah. ones who were most likely to be blasting things together. And so <laughs> there were rumors between the two countries as to who was doing what. And mm-hmm. initially, Russia totally took it out of the gate. And with their own potato. Yes. That <laughs> yes. And so kind of from there, it was just like, who could one up the other as a thing? But I think ultimately there was concern too, especially once Sputnik launched for the first time, that, oh my gosh, if we can do that, then who's going to control the space, you know, space around us? Who owns it? Which, you know, hey, colonialism, it's everywhere. Yeah. 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 Yep. Yeah. Well, and I think one of the things that I remember learning, maybe it's from Apollo 13, I don't know, was in the space race. Part of it was that Kennedy said, we're going to land a man on the moon by the end of the decade. And the impression I got, at least, was if Kennedy had not been assassinated, it may or may not have happened. But because he was assassinated, then people were like, we got to do it. And there was extra energy around doing it I mean, his name is everywhere, Mm -hmm. right? Kennedy Space Center, all that stuff. But yeah, yeah, I don't know. That's my impression. I think that there's probably some accuracy to that. You know, he made that speech after, I believe, after John Glenn had gone and had his first orbits. So we were definitely, we were in it. And that impetus Mm -hmm. of, yes, we're going to do this. We're going to do this by the time the decade is out. And yeah, I think a lot of it was that emotional response to his assassination like we've got to do it because he said we were going to do it and it doesn't matter yeah 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 which like there are worse reasons to do that sure yeah and i'm happy that we got to get into space and explore it and like yeah yeah there's a part at the beginning of the movie interstellar where they have rewritten history to say that there is no space exploration because everybody is dying of famine and there's blight on all the crops and all of that stuff and the main character was part of the space program and so has taught his kids the truth and stuff and he's fighting with the teachers and the folks to be like no this was real like you have to have dreams of exploration and wonder and awe in order to be here on earth yeah that is part of what motivates us and what makes us do the things that we need to do to survive Mm -hmm. absolutely and i love that kind of a thing yeah yeah okay so we mentioned john glenn's like whoop loop-de-loop around the earth (laughs) i love it yes there are probably technical terms for that but loop-de-loop is better orbit is not nearly as fun as loop-de-loop i like (laughs) loop-de-loop exactly exactly And so in the beginning, back in John Glenn's day and stuff, there was like a type of rocket ship. And now we have a space shuttle, which feels like a big change. Can you tell us about what that shift has been like in like, isn't it more comfy? I think the space shuttle is supposed to be reusable, but like they rebuild it all the time anyway for safety or something. Tell us. They were designed to be reusable rather than just continuing to just blow up things. Blow up and... (laughs) And so, I mean, yeah, there would have needed to be fixing and things. They weren't rebuilding it completely. Okay. I could imagine they would take it apart and put it back together again. Yeah. Probably. Kind of like driving a car. Just to make sure everything's probably put together correct. That's probably what I was misunderstanding. Yeah. 
my sense is it would have to be bigger because I think it was the Mercury ones. They were on, I think it was a Redstone rocket. So it was like considerably smaller rocket compared to the Saturn, which is what took the Apollo folks because, the, and again, not an engineer, mm -hmm. although I, you know, minister with engineers, which mm -hmm. we'll get to at some point because I mean, they Purdue, the cradle of astronauts. Hmm. I didn't know that. Oh yeah. That uh, I will the campus pastor there. Oh my gosh. Everything is coming together. We will get to it. I promise, because it's like a highlight of my life. <laughs> so like the, the amount of fuel needed to get you to a point depends on the size of the rocket. So the tiny ones, mm -hmm. the redstones were just to get into space and back. And I think even by, so that would have been the first two Mercury ones, which were Alan Shepard and Gus Grissom. They didn't orbit. Mm -hmm. They just went up and came down. Alan Shepard was in space. More successfully than Elon Musk, right? Huh. Yeah. Yeah, ah. Yes. At least the first two manned ones, like the unmanned ones, definitely trial by error, which if you want like fun visual of that, October Sky, the movie October Sky has a great Ooh. like montage of rockets not working out. Yeah. And that's another great space movie. It's more like not so much about space, but just kind of the early Sputnik stuff. It goes with our media list. We're doing a media list this season yes. and compiling all of the book recommendations. And yeah, all of that I did stuff, read the so, book yeah. it was based on by Homer Pickham. So yeah, in that one, it was also super tiny. So like they were strapped in and it was not designed for them to be able to move at all. And their suit basically, it looks like tinfoil that they were wearing. <laughs> so it was, it was designed for you're going to go up and come back down. And the plan is you live through it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. We want you to live through it. And that's about as bare minimum as we get. Kind of like driving around in the back of the station wagon in the 80s. Like, you fly <laughs> there, you get through it. Then in the Gemini era, that was the two-man manned era. And so the spacecraft was a little bit bigger, and it was designed for being in space longer. So the Gemini program was more for, like, we're kind of testing out what we need to get to the moon in the next phase. Mm -hmm. And because of that, then they were able to more freely move around because they were going to be in space for, like, a few days sure and so you have to and be able... being strapped in for two days right oh not God. a good idea yeah i mean you have yeah. to be mentally tough be to be an astronaut but that's that's crossing the line to psychological yep. torture that we don't really need yeah right yeah right We're trying I mean, to decrease psychological the torture do does not have to go along with exploration i don't think mm -hmm. agreed agreed mm -hmm. i mean colonizers might say differently but oh yeah, yeah. absolutely that's why i'm not one <laughs> <laughs> by Apollo, because the aim was the moon, the rocket was massive compared to all the other ones because it just needed that much more fuel. And again, mm -hmm. they were going to be in space for like a couple weeks. So they needed more space. But they also had different, you know, capsules, different pieces of the spacecraft sure. that yeah. they were going to be. And they'd like, mm -hmm. and it would, letting it go would also simultaneously propel the ship forward. Yep. So then when it comes to like shuttle and space station, I'm guessing probably with shuttle, because it was more designed for like kind of that long-term stuff, it would have been probably much more user-friendly, community-friendly, mm. I suppose. Sure. I don't know. Yeah, that tracks. That makes sense with... Now I'm like picturing all of the movies I've ever watched with sure. space travel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, and from what I understand, <laughs> living on the space station is about the same comfort level as living on the space shuttle. It seems like they're kind of similar in that way. But the space station, you know, it stays up there. It's an international endeavor. It seems so extraordinary to me that we would have something like that, especially when we're not really great at working on international projects on the ground. But <laughs> right. <laughs> so what can you tell yeah. us about the space station? Like just how international is it? And what is life like there? I did kind of research this a little bit because I was curious about it myself. From what I know, the creation of it was primarily U.S., Russia, China, and India, maybe Japan, maybe, that they all contributed actual pieces to the original conglomeration of the space station. It wasn't the first, like, international thing. I think Skylab was maybe international-ish in the sure. 70s, but the first actual international flight was Apollo Soyuz. I don't mm. speak Russian. I apologize to any of our listeners. Oh, that's what language it was. I was trying to figure out what language, and I was like, uh, I don't when, know. when we're talking about space, it's quite often Russian. Yeah. Yes. That makes sense. Yeah. We're the two main players. China's getting up there. India's getting up there. But for the history of, you know, since the 50s, it's been U.S. and Russia. Yeah. But yeah, so I looked quickly that 
so far there have been 70 some countries represented in terms of astronauts coming to wow. the space station and spending time that's there. a lot more than i thought okay yeah which is awesome yeah but I think the U.S. and Russia are the ones that launch people to get up to the space station. I don't think sure. China or India are, like, connecting that way. But we do have astronauts from all over. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Speaking of Skylab, which, according to Wikipedia, was American, not international. Okay. But there is, depending on your perspective, a potential labor strike that happened by American astronauts who were in space on Skylab 4. And I'm curious what your thoughts are on what happened. This is not something I knew about until I saw this question that you sent ahead of time. (laughs) Same. I I think I came across it in a podcast or something a million years ago, and I remain fascinated. But Okay. Yeah, I just I briefly Googled this morning and the NASA webpage says that's not true, that it wasn't a labor strike. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I wonder why they'd say that. There were different circumstances. That's that, the official thing. Right. That's why I'm like, well, now I want to know more. Because according to them, at least, it was like a whole bunch of just different circumstances that like didn't turn out well, but in the process, they figured out different ways to like make conditions much better for astronauts who needed time off, even when they sure. are in space for multiple days at a time, which, yeah, that seems like a no brainer. Uh huh. <laughs> but how do you take time off when you don't get to leave? I don't know. Yeah, I thought it was fascinating. And the Wikipedia article that I read on it had like the, the links to which NASA went to make sure everybody was saying this was not a strike, this Mm -hmm. was not a strike. But they have two of the three astronauts on record saying this was not a strike. The third astronaut is not on record saying it was not a strike, Mm -hmm. which I think is interesting. And it was a bunch of different things, right? They were all first-time astronauts. They had a last-minute change that increased their workload and work expectations. And at least one had either mental or physical health problems when they first got up there. I mean, claustrophobia has to be a thing, right? Gracious. Probably. I think they do yeah, move that know. in training. Sure. Or like... But I could still see how it would surprise you getting up there. Yeah, it, absolutely. Yeah. 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 And then they had so much work they had to do that they shifted from everybody being on the communication things. Because they aren't always in communication. It's only a set period of time where they're in the right spot over the earth that they can communicate Mm -hmm. and so instead of having everybody there they let the other two people work and they would rotate one person who was doing it and they forgot there are air quotes there forgot to communicate one day and so once that's passed there's nothing you can do until that time comes back again but i particularly think and this is why i'm really glad that kay asked this question and why i want to push back against the nasa narrative Mm -hmm. the company line Yeah. yeah is that there is something really powerful in what happened after right and this is where when we talk about labor and we talk about unions and we talk about striking it does make a difference and so After that, then NASA, they had a like, in the church we'd say, come to Jesus. An airing of grievances, right? Like a naming of the things. (laughs) A festivus for the rest of us. And NASA was like, okay, you're right. This is not sustainable. And made changes to give them more rest. And then what happened? They did more. Right, like When they were actually cared for and had time to rest, they were better able to function. And they not only got done all of the things they were supposed to get done, plus the like bonus stuff that they added on right before they left, but they did more than that. Yeah. And so it's just like all of the times where people are pushed back against like vacation and all of that stuff. And I'm like, even if you don't care about people's own well-being, they do are better workers when they get vacation. Yeah, and that is proof positive right there. When we were in the early stages and with the Ellen Shepard, Gus Grissom, John Glenn stage of you're in space and we think you're going to get back home, but we have not done this before. So, you know, that's a hope thing rather than a knowing thing. Uh, You know, I understand them not getting time off while they're in space for one, two, three days, something like that. But once you get up there for weeks, that's a whole different ballgame. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it was the fourth group. Like, it wasn't the first time that they were up there. People had been up there before. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
So Apollo 11 was not the only mission to set foot on the moon, although some of the missions that were supposed to didn't. We love you, Apollo 13. We'll get to you later. But what were some of the goals of the other missions that managed to get to the moon? So aside from just repeating the experiment of can we land and come back safely, I think (laughs) once they did that, and I think especially after Apollo 13, I think that, you know, they had a lot of these plans in place to begin with. But a lot of it was looking at different topography on the moon and trying to mm-hmm. see different geological surveys. So especially by 15, 16, and 17, for sure, part of their training on Earth was how to take core samples, which is, hmm. I should talk to my dad. He was a geologist. He knows how to do that <laughs> stuff. But like, drilling so you get a good chunk of like depth of rocks. And in fact, I think it was on 17, Harrison Schmidt was a geologist. He was the first like, air quote scientist that was more than just like an astronaut to be on a flight and oh, cool. so that was a big part of what they were scheduled to do they also were trying out different machinery things so it was on 15 that they introduced the lunar rover which is this <laughs> fun little scooter that would go around yeah. and they used that on 15 16 and 17 they also were again testing out length of time on a different gravitational field and that kind of stuff. So I think a lot of the goal was more exploration, but I think there probably was also a sense of, you know, we could maybe set up like a lunar station, like a military base or something. Because I mean, a lot of this really is rooted in military power and control. So if that's Mm -hmm. an unofficial goal, I think that was a big part of it. Like, could we have a sustainable space up here? And so here's what we'll do. Because 11 was on the surface for only a few hours, but by 17, they were on the surface for like three or four days. Wow. Which is extra impressive because with 11, they landed right at or around sunrise, right? Because it was either how do you keep somebody warm or how do you keep somebody from burning alive. And so they were like, we're going to try and keep somebody from burning alive more than trying to keep somebody warm. It takes less energy generally. Yeah. 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 So they landed, but they were like paranoid about making sure they had plenty of time to then get off the surface of the moon before the sunset on the moon. And I just think it's fascinating because they landed like right at the beginning and then weren't on for all that long. And then we're off. And then to like graduate into the space where they're there for several days is a really cool growth in the program Mm -hmm. and in like science and technology and knowledge and all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Another book I will commend is called A Man on the Moon by Andrew Chaikin, C-H-A-I-K-I-N. And I like this one because... I love a good appendix. And so it gives really simple data of all the Apollo missions from 7 to 17. Oh, cool. So 11 was on the surface for 21 hours, but they walked for two. So the craft itself was there. They were in their craft for like 19 of the 20 some hours. That seems like a missed opportunity there. I agree. But I think they were really, (laughs) they wanted to make sure. Yeah. If you don't know if someone's going to burn alive, like NASA had a really good record. They still do. (laughs) Let's keep it. By all means. True. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Well, and they also, part of the planning of the schedule of like how things went was because you've got the two guys on the surface and we use guys because it was all men, which I'm sure we'll get to. Uh We're going to get to that because I watched a thing. (laughs) Yes. But you also had the third one in 11. It was Michael Collins. He was in the command module that was continuing to orbit. And so the timing of when they could try to launch off the surface had to coordinate with where he was going to be so that yeah. they could rendezvous and dock up again and bring everybody home. So, you know, sure. it, it kind of gives this image of like a choreography. I think a lot of engineering is choreography in a way that you got to make sure that things coordinate well. Yeah. I love space exploration as a dance. I like this. Yeah. I'm here for it. Maybe we should get a dancer for one of our <laughs> next There you go. Guests. Yeah. Okay, so there's lots of people, though, lots of men who have been astronauts and some of the rest of us. But it seems like there's a lot of folks, like with Skylab, I noticed everybody, it was their only flight up. And it seems like a lot of astronauts retire shortly after space travel or only go up once. Not all of them. Some of them are like frequenters. But we also know that like 
a lot of changes happen to bodies during space travel. Like we had the one experiment with the twins where one stayed down and one went up and then we compare their bodies afterwards and during and all of those things. Sure. Can you tell us more about what happens to people? Like, yeah. Tell us more about the like in space, back from space, all the thing. Well, I think part of it is related to gravity. That feels mm-hmm. like obvious, but I mean, it, gravity really does impact a lot of how our bodies function. Sure. Yeah. You can't like finish pooping. Right. Yes, that is absolutely true. (laughs) I was pretty sure we were going to get to how do you go to the bathroom in space eventually, but I wasn't expecting it to be here. Okay, sure. I mean, I feel like Tom Hanks gave a great explanation of that in Apollo 13. So, you know, drive around, roll around. (laughs) And I don't know how they do the pooping part, but that is fascinating. I don't know too much, but like Alan Shepard is a good example because they just, they didn't know. Russia had only... Mm -hmm got somebody up and down like a month before Alan Shepard. And in his 15 minutes, something happened with his eardrums. So he wasn't able to fly for a really long time because of Mm. an eardrum thing. He didn't fly again until Apollo 14, which he was fun. He was originally slated for Apollo 13. And then his, he had an ear infection. And so they got bumped to 14. That is true. That is in the movie and it's true. But so that was something they didn't anticipate. And I think that's also why they planned for him to be up and down because they were just like, we have no idea what's going to happen to him Yeah, when yeah. he's up there. Like, Which is a responsible like first attempt. Right. The scientific process. Yeah. yeah. And as scary it is, as it is having humans as your experiments, like, yeah, they knew the risks. They knew that's what they were doing. And yeah, you got to remember too, a lot of these early astronauts were test pilots. So they had built their careers, like putting themselves in extreme situations for the sake of mm-hmm. science. Yeah but also for defense because that's what they were doing. Yeah. But, you know, and I'm going to reference back to Apollo 13 again because I think it showed a lot of really good stuff, like being up in space for that long in those early programs, they didn't have a lot of like exercises or understanding of like what to do to kind of maintain your physiology while you're in space. So, you know, when they land, they were not asked to land and like start walking. So, you know, they were, you know, carried up from their ships on a little raft in the ocean and, this thought just occurred to me. I don't even know if there's any truth to it. But before the shuttle, most of America flights that landed, landed in water uh, yeah. in the oceans. Russia did yeah. not. They tended to land more in their land. And I don't know how they did that. But huh. interesting things. But that was part of, you know, as they started to do much more prolonged time in space. Like that was a lot of like their initial experimentation of what do we do? What can we do to kind of keep bodies from deteriorating differently because of the lack of gravity. So I think now I've seen, and I couldn't tell you where, but I feel like I've seen like they've got like exercise bikes and they've got machines mm-hmm. that like they strap their hands and their feet to, to help them get resistance again, because yeah, no sure. gravity means no resistance. Yep. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's a little bit like in water, mm-hmm. there's like an easier movement that people have when they're in water, which is why like people who are older or who have like joint problems can do exercises in water, but not like just with regular gravity stuff. But water provides the resistance. And so having something else that can help with the resistance mm-hmm. is helpful. Yeah. 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 I think one of the Apollo 13 astronauts, maybe like... I had read that in the like coming down and not going back up that like he had had his goal his whole life. I think we talked about it in my psychology class in high school because my psychology professor made us write 100 goals. And he was like, as you accomplish goals, you have to keep adding to them because and the example was this astronaut who like his goal was to go up into space. And that was such a big goal that he didn't have other goals as well. Hmm. And so once he did that, then he just kind of floundered a little and was like, yeah, a lot more aimless and it, stuff. Be- and I think maybe even got depressed because he didn't have like the next thing to be working on because he hadn't even thought about a next thing. Mm-hmm. Sure. Because what do you do after you go to space? You know? I well, feel yeah. like the answer to that in the 1980s would have been go to Disneyland. But I- <laughs> Disney World, you're not far from Kennedy yeah. Space Center, so. Yeah, right? in Disney World, sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, interesting. Hmm. So NASA has famously never had anyone die in space, like once you get to space. But they have had a few tragedies, including Apollo 1, Challenger, and Columbia. Can you tell us a little bit about those stories and how they happened? I would say those three are probably 
Probably the toughest only because, you know, as like there have been commissions and reports after the fact that highlights sure. where human error absolutely could have prevented them. Sorry, I, I think you said where human error could have prevented them. And I don't think that's what you meant to say. You're right. Human oversight. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And one of the things I was looking at today, and I don't know enough about it that maybe I probably shouldn't talk about it, but <laughs> anyway, is that, that's okay. you know, that there was some awareness that there were things that weren't completely up to snuff, mm-hmm. shall we say? And it was written down, but there wasn't like the, the right process to follow through. Yeah. So with Apollo 1, a lot of that could have been prevented had, had there maybe been some more boldness. I think that's maybe something that a lot of us struggle with anyway. Like when we see a slight mm-hmm. wrong, we're not entirely sure. Like, should, should I, could I, like, what's that risk right, like- for myself? We don't have practice taking those risks or like doing those courageous things. And so then when we are like in a situation where it's called for, we're like, we freeze. How do I even do it? And for those who might not be familiar with the story, because a lot of us have seen what happened with Challenger and Columbia on television, but Mm. Apollo one, that story was, it was supposed to be the first Apollo mission and the craft essentially burned on the launch pad and Gus Grissom and I think another astronaut were killed. Three. So it was Gus Grissom, Roger Chaffee, and Ed White were the three that were killed because they were just doing a basic test of kind of all systems go before they were going to launch. And something sparked in the cabin. It was like 100% oxygen, which they've learned not to do now. Yeah. And the ha- there was something with the hatch that they couldn't open from the inside. It could only be opened from the outside. Mm-hmm. There were like a couple other things, I think, that just weren't quite right that, you know, I, I don't think you could say it was any one person's fault. It was just no. a lot of not thinking about, oh, yeah, here's all of these. How they- yeah. Not, not actually checking all of the things. Yeah. So, yeah, that one was really tough because... None of us expected it. And it wasn't even the mission to go to the moon. They were just going to test the rocket. They were just going to go into Earth orbit and mm-hmm. never made it off the ground. And that yeah. that definitely changed, I think, the NASA program like indefinitely. Anyway, I mean, they didn't launch again until late 1968. I think Apollo 7 launched in, I want to say, like maybe spring or summer. So it was like, How'd they skip from Apollo 1 to Apollo 7? The other ones in between were all unmanned. Mm-hmm. So there were, you know, a bunch of other Saturn rockets that launched that were technically Apollo, mm-hmm. but were not manned. So the manned ones get like the full names and things. Sure. Yeah. Gotcha. But it was like 18 months between the fire in January 1967 until they did another manned one. And it, that one, again, was just Earth orbit because sure. just, we yeah. just want to make sure we can get on our bike again. Do the really. Yeah. 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 Oof. And then Challenger in Columbia, which... Challenger was the one where it was the first... First civilian, Krista McAuliffe. She was the teacher. Yeah, and that one, again, was just kind of circumstance that the day it launched, because it had exploded on launch day, that mm-hmm. there were pieces in the craft that were not used to cold weather, and it was, like, unusually right. cold in Florida on launch day, and so they didn't realize that those maybe washers or something had shrunk and that's they were made out of rubber oh. yeah richard Feynman did a famous interview on one of the news shows explaining why this happened and uh, so he brought out a rubber band as he was starting to explain what was going on and dropped it in a glass of ice water and left it in there for a couple of minutes and then once he finished explaining what had happened he pulled out the rubber band and pulled it and it snapped immediately because it was so cold and that yeah. explained mm. what had happened yeah Interesting. Question. Yeah. And then with Columbia, and I, I looked it up this morning to try and like remember a little bit what happened because I remember that one. I sometimes get like, I didn't know about Apollo 1, but then also sometimes I get Challenger and Columbia flipped in my head. So same. Yeah. Yeah. Same. With that one, because that was in 2003, it seems like what they discovered is that when it launched, that a piece of, for lack of a better word, styrofoam or something it came off. And they didn't think that it would cause a hole in like the heat shield. They didn't, they didn't think it was going to cause a major issue. And so when the shuttle came back two weeks later, that's when Columbia exploded was mm. as it was racing through the atmosphere and all of the heat didn't have the right places to go. And so sure. that one, all, all souls lost on that one as well. So not, not great for sure, but again, a lot 
a lot learned, I think, in the process. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and mostly we just hear about the United States and Russia and occasionally like the EU. But how many countries have equipment and or the people to do space travel on their own? I mean, there, a lot of nations do have their own space agencies, but they're more launching things like satellites and sure. unhumaned things, we shall say. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So the four that have the capacity to send humans to space are China, U.S., um, Russia, and India. But only China is the only other agency besides Russia and U.S. to send humans successfully to space and safely returned. Sure. Okay. But astronauts come from all over the place, it sounds like. Mm -hmm. I think there's a whole lot of different ways that people end up flying and how, how they get connected to it. To be an astronaut, as far as I have figured out, at least back in the day, the criteria were more about like your physical stature and again, aiming for like test pilots for that risk factor. Sure. It was about, you know, being under 40. So I don't qualify anymore. Yeah. An excellent physical condition, whatever that means. And then being short. So under 5'11". <laughs> I mean, PBS has a Makers docuseries mm. and their second season of it they did a bunch of like women in whatever and their third episode of season two or sixth episode in the series is women in space and it is fascinating and will piss you off oh i'm so excited to watch it by and large women were way better at all of this than men and they had to figure out a way to keep women from being astronauts and you had to be at a certain level in the air force in order to be an astronaut and women were not allowed to be in that role in the air force and therefore were not allowed to be astronauts even though they scored better on the like tests where they like had to remove all the senses and all of that stuff they tested better on everything other than the actual experience that they were allowed to have yeah yeah, it was a made up thing. Sure. <laughs> because Well the patriarchy is a made up thing, so that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. I do remember reading that the women were generally physically smaller and therefore took up less space in the aircraft. They ate less. Mm-hmm. They were less likely to get like explosively angry under stress, which is kind of important when you're mm-hmm. in a tin can over the planet. All sorts of things. Yep. And they could just yeah. like float. Yeah. Yeah. They could float better without fidgeting and getting anxious. Yeah. Which is interesting because Russia, one of their first humans was a woman that went up into yeah. space and came back. And that was in the 60s. Her name is Valentina Tereshkova. Yep. She was in space for three days, made 48 orbits. And that was in May of 1963. And she was a civilian, which is also a big cool thing because it took the U.S. how many extra yeah. decades for women and civilians? Sure. Which is like, right? Because the way that they kept women out was Saying no by civilians. like making it a requirement that you couldn't be a civilian, that you had to be in the military at a certain level. And Well, and that tells you some of the motivation too, was this wasn't just exploration for exploration's sake. It was with defense in mind. Yeah. 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 Which is like a whole thing that we'll get into, especially in the Bible passages that we have later that I think are just fascinating. Mm-hmm. But yeah. So, okay. We jumped around a little bit, but that was like back in the day, what was required to become an astronaut. But like nowadays. So I tried to look this up because now we also have not just NASA, but we also have the military branch, the Space Force, which is Mm -hmm. five years old, I think. Which is a bull thing that we hate. But yeah, I I mean, you get to RTG too. Maybe one day we'll rename it something that doesn't sound like that. Yes. (sighs) Yes. Although, honestly, if they want to keep the Star Trek logo, I can live with that. But <laughs> I love that. I'm here for that. But yeah, the rest of it is yeah. baloney. Yeah. So according to NASA.gov, to be considered for an astronaut position, you must be a U.S. citizen. You must possess a master's degree, although there's some notes about that, in a STEM field. So that's fairly broad, but including engineering, biological science, physical science, computer science, or math from an accredited institution, have at least two years of related professional experience obtained after your degree has been completed, or a thousand hours of pilot in command time on a jet aircraft, and pass the NASA long duration flight astronaut physical. Which is the thing that the women could do way better than the men back in the day. Oh, yeah. 
this was also like you know back in the day when we were much more commonly thinking of two genders and so yeah yeah there you go so that's where I'm going to nerd out on the current institution with which I serve Purdue University <laughs> as the cradle of astronauts because up until like huh. only in the last few years Purdue had produced the highest number of astronauts as an institution including notably Neil Armstrong and Gus Grissom to mm. the early well, I think the third one, Eugene Cernan was also a Purdue graduate and he was on Apollo 17, last one on the moon. But oh. there have been 27 astronauts of the 200 plus ish that graduated from Purdue. And at wow. least on the Purdue website, it does say nearly a third of all U.S. space flights have included a Purdue grad and 11 missions have wow. included multiple. So they call us the cradle of astronauts for a reason. <laughs> it's delightful. That is such a perfect call for you as a <laughs> campus pastor to a astronauts. Story, I had no idea. I had no idea. So even though I know a lot of stuff, I had no idea. And I came for like my interview weekend and yeah. one of the guys on the call committee like took me on a walking tour and we walked to Armstrong and Hall of Engineering, of which there is a statue of Neil and then like an art installation of... <laughs> the footprints that he left on the moon outside. And I was like, how did I not know? <laughs> and I, was like, I was feeling okay about this to begin with. And that was like, that seals the deal. I don't care. This is a sign like, from God. Is- <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did you walk in his footsteps? I haven't. I think you can. I don't think it's like off limits. But yeah, so Neil's got his own building named after him. I've heard, I haven't looked yet, but that a lot of his documents are in one of the libraries that kind of has an archive of Neil things. And then there's also, I think, a residence hall named for Gus Grissom. And he was one of the astronauts yeah. that was, he was in Mercury. He was in the Mercury program. He was the second American mm-hmm. in space. And then also perished in Apollo 1. Yeah. But yeah, so that's kind of fun. I will say, just looking at the list, most of them were men. But that's an unfortunate STEM issue. But at least on the list that they've compiled, and I'm not sure how recent this is, but a Purdue grad set a record for female astronauts after having been on five different space flights. Mm -hmm. Janice Voss. We name the we name these people. Janice Voss. All the men are named. Thank you. You're right. And then Beth Moses was the first female commercial astronaut, and also a Purdue grad. So. So by commercial astronaut, do we mean she was on like? Elon Musk or maybe Bezos. Let's see if I would guess that means not NASA. Probably not NASA. Yeah. Yeah. But hey, astronauts are astronauts are astronauts. Astronauts are astronauts when they are in it for the study and yeah. Yeah, I was gonna say until they sell their soul. Yeah, Yeah, they're astronauts. I have opinions apparently. (laughs) But theoretically speaking, as far as we're aware, no astronaut has actually sold their soul. Like we're not accusing anyone of anything other than Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. So Yeah. No, (laughs) because we don't actually consider Bezos or Elon Musk astronauts. No. Yeah. Astronauts is a title for a scientist, I think, at this point. Yeah. 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 Fascinating. Okay, so the other piece, space travel and space exploration is not without controversy. And we're not going to get into all of the controversies that we could. We got into a little bit of like labor disputes. But also, space travel itself takes a lot of equipment and energy. And we've seen the like, basically bombs exploding to set in order to send rockets up in the initial stages, but also like the amount of fuel and all of that stuff. But we don't often talk about like the environmental impact of it. And I kind of got into it a little bit in like the way Interstellar talks about it, which I think is really interesting of like space exploration inspires us. Yeah. But also there's this tension between environmental care and concern and space exploration. And aside from, you know, sending several billionaires on one way trips to space, what could help (laughs) space exploration and environmental concerns work better together? And I think that's kind of where the tension is, because a lot of, especially now that the focus has really been more on the space station and things like that, like a lot of the experiments and things that they are doing is looking to see what is possible for sustainable living, Mm -hmm. both on the planet and beyond, which is really good to know. Like they are growing plants on the space station. They are. Yeah, that first tomato that got lost and then recently found. Yeah. Which is so cool. And, you know, you think about the first pictures of the earth that, you know, were 
taken in, in the sixties of holy cow, look, look at this gorgeous, beautiful place. Mm-hmm. And th- we may get this when we talk about some of the scripture passages and, and the faith element, but a lot of the astronauts, you know, they realize the preciousness of this planet by that experience. And like, mm-hmm. that just gives me chills. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, conversely to get people into those places to do that kind of study is incredibly environmentally unsound and not just with the gases from the things that are, you know, exploded and released. But I mean, think of like the sound pollution of those things, you know, the populations Mm -hmm. in Florida of birds and animals and fish that are like destroyed completely because of the sound and the all the things. Yeah. I don't, until we can figure out like really good ways to use electricity without all that. I think it's, I don't call it a necessary evil, but it like the consequence yeah. does not yet outweigh the benefit. Yeah. And I think part of it is the until we put the effort in, right? As with all environmental concern stuff, yep. we could be putting more effort in to figure something else out. We're choosing not to, or we're choosing to put our energies elsewhere. But there's also, it doesn't seem like a lot of pressure on NASA in particular. I think as the commercial space travel stuff grows, there's going to be more pressure probably as like, because the impact of one or two space programs globally going up one or two times a year or whatever is not nearly the same as, hey, pay us a million dollars and we'll take you up into space for a weekend. Yeah. Like, yeah. big difference. Yeah, yeah. I remember seeing a poll done of uh, international people who are not American citizens uh, asking them, what is your like favorite or most hopeful thing about America? And universally, almost the answer was NASA. Hmm. Like NASA yeah. gave them hope about America in particular. Yeah. I mean, also like every year in December, the Atlantic does a like space picture advent calendar. <laughs> and it's mostly Hubble and JWS telescopes but the like the images are just so beautiful and so inspiring and like probably shouldn't say this so this might just be on our patreon cut but i every year like download them and convert them and make them the backgrounds on my computer and it just rotates through images of space because i love it so Kristen, do you have some space program myths you would like to bust and perhaps in particular is there a documentary or something of yes we actually went to the moon and yes we can prove it that you would like to suggest <laughs> Ooh, okay this is mythbusters the space program edition because we had the mythbusters magi edition yes and in our second episode so now it's mythbusters space program edition well i think that that feels like the biggest one is this conspiracy theory that we never actually landed on the moon and so the documentary i would highly recommend is in the shadow of the moon it's one that i watch at least once a year either around christmas time or july 20th when i celebrate my space things cool and it's ron howard directed so you know he also did apollo 13 but he interviewed many of the astronauts at the time who were still alive i think it was 2012 when it came out who were on these lunar missions and either as command module pilots like michael collins or as people who landed and they talk about it they're like it is really offensive when people say we never went there because i've been there i can tell you my experience and we just don't like to validate other people's experience in unhealthy yeah. ways anyway. But, you know, I think the adage of how could, how many hundreds and thousands of people are behind the scenes of this to create such a massive conspiracy like that, that is insane Yeah, <laughs> to make up the whole thing and spend all this money for it to not be real. Like, Well, and I think it feels like there's a connection between the like landing on the moon is a myth and the Holocaust deniers. Yeah. And like, like both of those were like, there is visible photographic and film evidence plus personal, like first person accounts. And still somehow like it gets dismissed. And like, there's a very different thing, right? Like one is denying a genocide and the other, but the other is like, like why are people, I guess like part of it is the, what's the benefit Yeah, yeah. in denying it. Convince people not to trust the government. And that's probably part I of guess. it. Yeah, I guess. But yeah. it just seems, yeah. It's weird. I, I don't know of any other space myths that I've okay. heard of. I guess there are, maybe are some that think that, you know, astronauts are seeing aliens in space and like not talking about it. But I haven't heard too much about that. 
Okay. Which, like, last season, our Ascension Day episode was on UFOs. Or UAPs. And also, there's, like, something to be said for, like, it's entirely possible that there's some one or many species out there that are, like, smarter than us and figured out how to, like, get here. Yeah. And there's some, like, Susanna, who's a friend of the podcast, Susanna Porter, dives deep into, like, some conspiracies and stuff sometimes and does the, like, cult, like, all of those, like, documentary things. But there's, like, some stuff that she's talked about of, like, the damage that was supposed to be done environmentally from a nuclear explosion or a nuclear, like something that happened in in like Japan or something with the nuclear sites there that was supposed to be way more damaging than it ended up being and like so there's like a thing of like maybe maybe octopuses really are aliens no but (laughs) but that like what if what if and it requires humans and this is where I think space travel also is amazing is that it requires humans to realize that we are not the center of the universe that we are not the pinnacle of creation and it, it's just like like in our creation accounts in the Genesis 1 creation account like humans are the final thing made but in the Genesis 2 one we're the first things made and then everything else is made and and those give different understandings of the world yep. and our place in it. Mm-hmm. Different cosmologies. See our first episode. <laughs> but also, like, being in space, right? Seeing the tiny blue dot of Earth. Seeing the vastness of outer space. There's no way that we are the center of the universe. Yeah. Like, it just is not feasible to think that when you're in space, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, I don't know, it's just fascinating. Yeah. This feels like the right time to bring up Apollo 8 anyway, because Mm. Apollo 8 was the first human mission to orbit the moon. They didn't land, they just orbited. And that was Jim Lovell Mm -hmm. and Frank Borman and Bill Anders. And so they were the first humans to see the backside of the moon, the dark side of the moon. And so for that time when they were orbiting, they were farther from Earth than any human and they could only see everything that was behind and the vastness mm. of that. And just like the awareness of that was just mind blowing for these guys. And so when they came around again and saw the earth rise, as they called it, like that's the infamous yeah. photo of this earth rise yeah. from the moon was Frank Borman. He took that as they were coming. It was just like, this is exactly like the enormity of space and the yeah. smallness of us, but yet the privilege of us to be a part of this, like, Mm-hmm. so many of them afterward became like different activists in environmental ecology or, you know, went into government positions or, you know, things like that because they were changed by this experience and perspective. And that's, you know, I think either astronauts that came in with, with an ounce of faith or sense of religion was amplified by that, but there were a few that their experience in the Apollo program particularly was kind of what, converted their heart to understand like a bigger bigger picture and the possibility of a deity or something which is partly why on apollo 8 which was in december of 1968 that they did a a broadcast on earth from the orbit of the moon on christmas eve and they read the genesis one i think they read the entire narrative as part of their television broadcast which is just a beautiful lyric poem to begin with But it also meant NASA got sued by Madeline Murray O'Hare, who was a very devout atheist and was like, we cannot be doing this. Like, this is horrible that you're doing this. Which is not necessarily a terrible conversation to have, but... Right, exactly. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. But they also didn't read it to, like, convert hearts and minds and because they were on a mission. It was just like, this just fits. This is the language Mm -hmm. that we have for this experience. And that's the other reason I watched the documentary in the shadow of the moon around Christmas time, because they play that recording. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, "Ah." yeah. I don't think I've seen it. I have to check it out. It is hard to find. It's not on streaming anywhere. I think so. A couple other like just quick facts about the space program. There are, according to NASA's website, and we will link to it, 35 current space missions happening. Some of them are like the mission was extended, right? So they have it in like name order Mm -hmm. but like the aqua mission is an earth observing system and it's an extended mission and so like some of them i think are just like regular old satellites orbiting the earth and like taking pictures of the earth but then there's also like other ones our beloved robots on mars 
our beloved, Very beloved yeah. robots on Mars. For sure, for sure. And also, I have to share this because one of my dear favorite almost four-year-olds has absolutely adored the Lucy mission, which is currently heading out to explore the Jupiter Trojan asteroids. Cool. And mm-hmm. this child calls them Jupiter's pockets because they're like <laughs> asteroids so they're I part of that. Jupiter, but like they can collect things. Nice. <laughs> Jupiter's pockets. I love it. Which I love. And she also discovered the Parker Solar Probe, which anyone who knows her will know exactly why that's such a big deal. But that was launched in 2018, and the target is the sun. So it's on a mission to touch the sun, which is to say to fly through the corona, the upper atmosphere of the sun. Good thing they didn't name it Icarus. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Pace and I did for Horror Nerds at Church, but it not last season, but the season before, because we went on hiatus for the strike. But there was a movie that we watched that was Sunshine, that's like a space horror type movie, and they named it Icarus. So mm-hmm. it's a good one though. It's it's really good. Like I was like, I love space movies. It yeah, sometimes fantastic. space it's movies great, are like, better because they're not based on real life. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But yeah, so highly recommend that movie too. But So there are like a whole bunch of missions. Are there any missions that you're particular? I loved the mission that gave us our first in-focus images of Pluto. I am firmly team Pluto as we established <laughs> in the as yet unrecorded, but as of airing, previously aired solar system episode. Sure. Yeah. Uh, have you read the book, How I Killed Pluto and Why I Had It Coming? <laughs> no. I mean, it's very How interesting. And Pluto has clearly, like, had some identity issues. I'm also team Pluto at the planet. And we should add Sharon and not just, like, let him hang out. But I got a giant pint glass from the Adler when I was still in Chicago in seminary that is, like, a Pluto resting, revolving piece is what it says. Oh, so it's just... It's delightful that this planet that we've known about for like less than a century. But you know what? Here's a good case in point that we have changed Pluto's identity multiple times now so we can deal with people's pronouns, right? Absolutely. Ah, yes. I love that. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like Pluto literally has a heart for us that's also breaking. Yes. (laughs) Do you have favorite current or like soon to be missions that you're like particularly interested in i don't know much about like some of those deep space exploration things but those are exciting when i do hear about them i'm not great about current news just in general but i mean they are working on going back to the moon with the artemis missions and so there are like human crews of many genders not just a singular one, which is excellent. Mm -hmm. They've also got humans that are starting to train for eventual Mars missions, which that is just blowing my mind as well, because, you know, it took how long for those little satellites and our fun little rovers to get there. Sure. The mental gymnastics one has to do to prepare for that. I think that's why I love this stuff is more of the human element. Like I love the pictures. I love some of that science stuff, but I love the human element of how are people preparing for these monumental experiences that nobody else has had and you can only prepare so much for an experience that nobody can tell you about yeah 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 but i do i I do love seeing a lot of those deep space things and i think it's awesome that we are doing a lot of um exploring just still within our little neighborhood and not just looking as far out as we can get although that's also just although those pictures are amazing mind-blowing yeah 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 Yeah. any other space myths we need busting or i think the only other one that came to mind was in the 90s when we got our first photos from the surface of mars and there was this rock formation that looked like a face that people freaked out about and i remember freaking out about (laughs) because like whatever shadow it looked like a sculpture like a human sculpture that any of us would make and it was like this is absolute proof that there's life on mars and eventually we realized oh no it's it's a rock formation that we caught the angles of the shadow and like seeing pictures of it from that different angle. It's like, Oh yeah. Okay, cool. But I remember that okay, being like a big thing when the face of Mars <laughs> came out. And I remember mentally mine. comparing that to the, the picture that came out after nine 11 of the cross and the rubble. And yeah, like, I mean, on the one hand, it's a lovely thought. And on the other hand, it, yes, I beams do cross each other. That is normal in buildings. And yeah. So. Mm-hmm. 
I think it just it, that speaks to our human need to find meaning in yeah all the things Absolutely. around us and find purpose. And if that's not a reason for thinking of higher divinity and sure. bigger perspective, I don't I don't see any other reason. Like yeah. we want to know we have a purpose. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's it's the ultimate concern, right? Mm-hmm. The thing that is greater than any one of us. We actually are just released on YouTube our episode on idolatry, interface relationships, and the ultimate concern, mm. and talk about that in that episode. So mm. we'll have to link to that as well. So favorite movie slash show about space program or involving space programs or anything of that. Oh, obvious. <laughs> Apollo 13, since that is the thing that started it all in the shadow yeah. of the moon, which I've mentioned. I think mm-hmm. it's also partly mm-hmm. why I like Doctor Who. I mean, yeah. Space yeah. and Time yeah. and a TARDIS and all that jazz. I also, I really like the movie First Man. That's Ryan Gosling, Neil Armstrong kind of biopic of sorts. I think that's, it's definitely more about the human than about the space stuff, but you get some of the space stuff too, which is kind of cool. Those are the ones off the top of my head. What about you guys? Yeah. I think in terms of movies, I have to go with Apollo 13. It's such a classic. Honestly, for real life space programs, I tend to read books rather than watching TVs or or movies. So for that, I would say uh, Lost Moon by Jim Lovell or October Sky are both very readable and also super fascinating. Yep. Hmm. Yeah. I also loved Apollo 13, as we have well established. (laughs) Also, the PBS Makers docuseries is fantastic. And like that episode on women in space, I like thinking about it, I was like, I should go back and like rewatch it. It's just like so clear. And I think all of their episodes were not just the one for women in space, but like women in all of the different things. Yeah. Clear about the ways that patriarchy impacts all of that. Also, fun fact... Did you know that when Sally Ride was first going up into space? Oh, yes. There were some engineers. There's a fantastic song that we will link to. There were some engineers who were like, oh, no, we don't know what to do. And so we're like, okay, we have to make sure she is like well supplied if she gets her period. Not that they asked her anything about what she needs or, you know. If it wouldn't even be a concern, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they like came up to her with a bag of 100 tampons tied together by the string. So like taken out of the pack, tied together with the strings uh-huh. for her week in outer space. Oh, 100 tampons. I knew about I didn't know they were tied together. That. Oh. <laughs> yeah, there's a song. I, we will link to it. It's fantastic. I We have linked to it before. We will link to it again. Yeah. How many engineers does it take to tie together 100 tampons? I don't want to know. Do not answer right. that question under any circumstances. <laughs> and like, the, the honest truth is she probably, A, knew if she was likely to get her period or not, and B, had what she needed just in case something went weird and she got her period even if she wasn't expecting it. She was probably already properly supplied. Yeah. The only thought I have to give them like an ounce of grace is that they needed to have the weight measurement of like what the weight of tampons would be. But again, that part is fair. It wouldn't have been necessary if they had talked to her. Yeah. And also, didn't they have access to like how many doctors does NASA employ? Like actual doctors, like medical doctors, like they have lots, right? So if they didn't want to talk to her because they thought it might make her freak out, they could have talked to literally any doctor. Yeah. Which I will segue. The other one I forgot to add is Hidden Figures. Oh, yes. Yes. A necessary movie and book. Mm -hmm. Yes. We will have done a movie commentary on that the month before Apollo 13. Yay! So that is the plan. You guys are knocking it out of the park. We are like the one we're doing for this, this month is Moana season because of the yeah the, we're doing Moana yeah I am Moana that's my favorite of all Disney movies forever and ever Aww. well it just sounds like you need to be a Patreon supporter I think it's happening. <laughs> yeah. screw my car payment I'm going on I'm nerd the churching oh it's not hey, nearly that it's expensive. way cheaper than your car payments <laughs> yeah yeah so. All of this is fantastic, and I could, like, keep nerding out about this for a very long time. But we also have the Bible yes. as, like, a faith-based podcast, right? Nerds at church. And I was, like, 
Yeah. Well, I was trying to, like, Google it. I was like, what does the Bible, like, what are biblical verses that connect to some version of, like, space travel, space exploration, space programs? And it was really interesting to me because the first two that we have to talk about both have this sense of, like, humanity in, like, the highest heights and that sort of a sense as like this haughtiness Mm. and so the first one is from psalm 115 verses 14 through 18 and particular verse 16 reads the heavens are the becoming one's heavens but the earth god has given to human beings and it's one of the ones that's used as an argument against space travel by like whatever christians think space travel is bad but it gives this sense of like exploration versus domination kind of stuff Right? Like where nowadays, at least we think of NASA and we think of exploration, even though the history and the like origins of NASA were not exploration. They were definitely about domination versus like the Space Force, Bezos, Musk thing, which is about domination. Mm -hmm. I just think that that's interesting because if we're taking it like super literally, then we could say like, yeah, no space exploration at all. But even that feels reductive for a psalm in particular that is like extolling God's praise and like telling people to not be like too cocky about things. Also, it just kind of sounds accurate in terms of we can explore Earth with a certain amount of expected safety, but like none of that safety is there in terms of exploring space. So we should think of it as this is not mm-hmm. our place. We we have to think of it as this is not our natural habitat because that will keep us alive. Well, and is there maybe part of the cosmology of, you know, we can't see the face of God, so we need to stay in our mm-hmm. arena because other if we get too close to God, then we are violating God sort of thing? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, especially, like, if we get too close to the sun, that definitely, like, yeah, yeah. If you die in space, you die in real life. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. Also, you said the face of God, and my immediate, like, fil- like finishing of your thing was not the face of God. It was the face of Bo. Yes! From Doctor Who. <laughs> and I was like, I mean, I have seen the face I, of Bo. I knew like, were... Yep. His name is Jack. Yeah. The other one that kind of gets at this is... Obadiah, which is a one chapter book of the Bible, but the fourth verse in particular, and I think the first three verses kind of help lead into it, but it's talking about like the proud and the haughty being brought low. And so it's this like, though you soar aloft like the eagle, though your nest is set among the stars, from there I will bring you down, says the becoming one. And so it's this like, you think you're better than everybody else. You think you can build your home. You think you can do all of these things. And yet... I am God, not you. And it it gives a little bit of like Tower of Babel, like you cannot replace me. Like, and I think there's just so much that like makes us think about and want to like be that, to be like, that's what commercialized space travel to me seems like is like the humans trying to be God, trying to play God, trying to do whatever they want to take over whatever we want, Mm -hmm. they want versus being in awe of space and yeah, yeah. I, don't, I don't know if either of you have thoughts on Obadiah also my cousin's name was Obadiah so I have like a special hmm. I mean, we, we don't hear from Obadiah very often I think that's the first I've looked no. at Obadiah in seminary so and I have to <laughs> no. admit I think this is the first time I'm hearing that there are Christians against space travel I suppose I should expect there are Christians against practically anything but <laughs> it's not like a lot it I it was like it's probably the same ones that are like anti-technology and yeah, that's, like that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I do think that that dynamic of is a human presence in outer space beyond the Earth about domination, or and this is where we keep coming back to Genesis one throughout this season, and I love it, and I like that we are like revisiting it because it does have the. Like, because it's so poetic in particular, it has this, like, awe and mystery that that just lends itself so well to the awe and mystery of space exploration and space programs. And, like, when you were talking about the, like, Earthrise and the broadcast on Christmas, I was like, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Welcome to my life. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Maybe a little verklempt, if you will. It's a good word. My secret goal in life. Well, I, I think the thing I personally love about that version of the creation story is that It isn't just like these broad sweeping things were created, like, because it's verse four that it's almost like the stars are like an afterthought in creation. It's the greater light, the lesser light and stars. Oh, yeah. And stars. (laughs) Like, 
oh, God, yeah, yeah. God thought of everything. <laughs> yeah, I think that's verse 16. Yeah. God made the two great lights. Yes. Yeah. 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 And I love that too. I love the that space of like, there's more. It wasn't just it's light and just, dark. Yeah. And I do appreciate the acknowledgement that there are some things where, you know, as much as STEM is important, we need something more in order to describe what happens. And so the poetry and the ancient languages and the tropes, you might say, that we've come mm-hmm. up with to speak about these extraordinary things are, are important. Yeah. That just yeah. totally, I can't believe I forgot about this movie, Contact. Yes. The movie Contact. Oh, yeah. That and is book. absolutely, that's a direct, they like, the poet. they yeah. should have sent the poet, because I can't describe any of it. Oh. Jodie mm. Foster is so good in that movie. And the book, Carl Sagan. Oh, yeah. Delightful. Yeah. And and the movie is dedicated to him because he actually died just before the movie came out. Right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I yeah. Well, I know what I'm watching later today. <laughs> yeah. Sure. That's one of my, like, like, oh, yeah. I used to always want to be an astronaut or, like, a space chaplain. <laughs> I think they need space chaplains, too. Especially if they're setting up Mars. I had that thought as I was cruising the Space Force website today. I'm like... You need all these civilians. You need all these military people. How about your chaplains? Where are your chaplains? Mm-hmm. Like these people yeah. are going to be having crises of faith up there. It, that is not even a question. Yeah. 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 And mm-hmm. speaking of space travel, now for our Muppets moment. So our Muppets question for today is which Muppet would you like to travel to space with? Krista? Only because I recently rewatched A Muppet's Christmas Carol, which is one of my favorites, I would want to fly with Rizzo because not only is he delightful and comedic, but he can fit in places without even realizing that he can fit in those places. Oh, that would be super and useful you on those tiny space. shuttles and everything. Yeah, and like getting yeah. into the tiny places with the tiny fingers. I can he, see that. he acts out of the box without even thinking about it. You need that in space. Sure. Also, you know, being made of fabric, he might not actually have to breathe true more <laughs> oxygen for me I feel, I feel like that's all of the muppets like that's just a bonus for all of the muppets. like i'm sure that if he had to do a spacewalk he yeah. would still demand some kind of space suit because he deserves to have a special suit for that but he wouldn't he actually would, have yeah, to worry we don't want him that. to freeze yeah you, you'd he, want to stay warm he's so cute in his little bubble helmet and yeah yes please <laughs> Speaking of Rizzo, I was thinking it would be really fun and delightful to go to space with Gonzo. Not Gonzo the Great, mind you. Just like normal Gonzo. Gonzo. Regular normal Gonzo. Gonzo. Yeah. yeah, but he just has like, and it's funny that you picked Rizzo and I picked Gonzo. Because like, they do have a rapport. So we could all four just like pop up there. Oh, yeah. But sure. Gonzo has like this way of like being in awe of things and also like articulating and talking about things that I just love and so I'm like yeah me and Gonzo Mm -hmm. yeah yeah so I will preface this by saying that my introduction to the space program and its history was mostly focused on the so this is unbelievably dangerous and yes they had these handful of accidents but mostly they've been fine but also (laughs) unbelievably dangerous and so Mm -hmm. when i go into space i want to go with like experienced astronauts people who know what they're doing and so i'm saying i'm going with the pigs in space (laughs) (laughs) because i don't want to die a horrible death and i think that's reasonable i am zero percent surprised that that is where you (laughs) went that's fantastic yeah well done. Well done. Yeah. 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 So, Kristen, any other thoughts on life, the universe, and everything? Other than I love the number 42. Yeah. <laughs> this yes. just this just continues to be like such a fascinating thing. And I'm super glad that you let me come and like geek out on it. And I don't get to talk about my space stuff enough, but this has just been really fun. And I'm excited to keep watching what NASA is up to and keep seeing different faces of Saturn and Jupiter's pockets and all of that jazz. So yeah, there's always more. Agreed. Agreed. Thank you so much for joining us, Kristen. This is ah, absolutely such a gift on this like snowy day. This is just everything is good today. <laughs> everything is good. <laughs> everything is awesome. Okay. <laughs> And dear listeners, thank you for joining us. Our theme music was by Rachel Meyer Lachlan. Our Muppets music was by Brenda Boss. And our seasonal artwork was by Pace Warfield. 
Catch us next time when we'll dive into books and our book talk episode. This podcast has been produced by us, Emily Ewing and Kay Roloff. For more fun, check us out on Twitter, Facebook, and Blue Sky at Nerds at Church, or contact us at Nerds at Church at gmail.com. Also, if you like what you've heard, rate us or leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Facebook, or wherever you catch your podcasts. If you want to access our uncut episodes, merch discounts, movie commentaries, and more, support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash nerds at church. Starting at just $5 a month, it's much cheaper than becoming an astronaut and spending a year on the space station like Scott Kelly while also having undiagnosed ADHD. (laughs) Yay! You got it! And also cheaper than Kristen's car payments. Yeah. That too, yes. Also, Much. let us know on Blue Sky Facebook or Twitter which Muppet you want to travel to space with. As the ancient Christians said, Pax Vobiscum.